Okay, so uh, we're in the second week of uh, the course uh, on introduction to statistical uh, inference, information, and learning, or oh, if you want uh, statistical data processing. And uh, so uh, we had uh, somewhat of a rough start, but uh, I hope uh, more or less stabilized. So we, we started to talk about. Um, based on decision theory, and I just want to review the, the important things about it. I'm sorry. All sorts of technical things I have to get used to again. So based on decision theory, which is actually a uh, the first chapter in what you call statistical inference, or oh, stochastic <laughs> Let me show a little bit of bold on that inference. Um, can somebody get uh, fresh colors for me? I just uh, from the sector. <laughs> I just want to, don't want to interrupt the class, but it's of course all used and will not be seen in a second. So. Um, Three colors, red, black, and blue. Thank you. Um, so the theory that the theory is actually a little bit uh, too much to call it a theory, but actually it turns out to be very, very fundamental and very important. Is really the formalization, the form of the intu intuitive formalization of the, if you want, or mathematical formalization of the very simple intuition that we have about decision making. And uh, it's really in the root of many, many different uh, fields or theoretical fields. One of them is called statistics or statistical inference. The other one is called uh, control theory. Another one is called uh, signal processing. And these are all branches of essentially the same thing. And, and then eventually what we call learning theory. And uh, Computational learning theory, these are always, and this is really the root in some sense. And it's really very important that you fully understand it and fully appreciate it because we're going to extend it and make it more and more complicated very, very quickly. So, that. so uh, I really want to, to, to be slow on that, but I also hope that all of you or most of you are following the course on the, on the notes because this will really help me if you read it before the lecture. So actually reading uh, Amir's English notes or our all the Hebrew notes uh, either are more or less equivalent at this point. Uh, actually I recommend Amir's notes which are newer and more correct in many ways. But it doesn't matter and actually can read it in many many other places. This is really standard textbook things. But uh, following the notes will help me and will help you Okay, so, and I really want to, to take the class more for giving you some deeper insights and understanding that after you read the notes and really addressing your own questions, uh, we'll give you something beyond the lecture notes. This is really, I really find it very important you're here because I really want to go beyond the notes, beyond the technical things, and give you some, some more insights about it. Okay, so, essentially our formalization of the of the Bayesian decision theory, just, just to remind you, is made of several concepts or quantities that are really important to understand. One of them is what we called 
the world states, first one, and this is really some sort of a fancy name for something very simple. I mean, so this is a set of states that partition the world into different entities, different categories, like day, night, rain, no rain, uh, Trump was elected or not elected, and so on. I mean, so this is basically a hard partition in the sense that all the elementary things in these states, in these states are disjoint, and one of them must have, so they're exhausted. I mean, okay? World state. Of course, the state is, the world is very complicated. And uh, so what we really usually do when we talk about the world state, we, we simplify it. I mean, so we project in some sense all the complicated things in the world onto one variable, let's say rain or no rain today. That doesn't mean that there are more things in the world. Of course, there are many, many other things, other variables, other, other constraints, other, a lot of complicated things going on in the world, but we care only about this particular position. So saying that the world is binary, has only two states, doesn't mean that the real world has only two states, but the parts of the world we care about. At this point, we divide it somehow into two states. Okay, that's what we mean by this. So assuming a simple space like this, I mean, so we're talking about some states of the world which belong to some set. It can be discrete, it can be infinite, it can be finite, it can be continuous, it can be multidimensional, it can be many, many things. Okay. The other component of our formalization is the notion of observation, which we generate you know, is filled by X later on. We separate into different types of observation. So this is what we call observation. And again, uh, so this is usually, these are usually random variables. And what do I mean by this? Anybody volunteer to try to define it? Yeah. 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 So usually what we mean by random variables are real valued, they can be complex or other, but usually real valued functions of our our instance space, not instance, instance space, I mean the spaces over our event space. So if you remember in probability theory, which I hope all of you reviewed by now a little bit, there's something called the, the instance space or the sample space, which is the elementary event, and there are subsets of this set like all the natural numbers, for example. <laughs> this can be the elementary events, and subsets can be things like the even numbers, the prime numbers, the given numbers, whatever you want. Actually, the given numbers are a bit tricky. No. So it can be many, many subsets of, this, of these numbers. Okay? So these are events. And those events, in probability theory, we assume that there's a set so the events are closed under three important operations, intersections, unions, finite, inter finite number of intersections, finite or countable number of intersections, countable number of unions, and complementary. So for every event, the complementary, not this event, is also an event. For every two events, the intersection of these two events is also an event. And for every two events, the union of these events is also an event. For, for the purpose of this course, this is usually all the sets, all the subsets, but those of you who know a little bit about mathematics uh, know that in continuous spaces or in infinite spaces in general, this is a bit tricky, and not all subsets are measurable in that sense. But forget about it. It's not important for us at this point. So essentially every subset of our space is, is measurable and has some probability. And a probability measure is some function which assigns number numbers within 0 and 1, with the caveat that when we talk about continuous, uh, continuous spaces, we have to be a little more careful about it, but essentially numbers within 0 and 1 to event space. Okay? Now, random variable is a function from the event space to the real numbers, which means for every event I have a number. Okay? This is a random variable. Usually we're talking about real-valued random numbers. It can be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, n-dimensional, whatever. 
But random variables, in our case, observations can be random variables, but they can also be things like words in language, or a state of the weather, or I don't know, uh, uh, whatever. I mean, things which are not numbers, but are variables in the sense that we can assign probability to them. Okay? Usually we actually prefer, for all sorts of technical reasons, to, to, talk, to talk about random variables as real value functions. But uh, in many cases, many cases that we are interested in, language is one of my favorite examples, but many others, they are not necessarily represented as, as numbers. We usually try to convert them into numbers because it makes life easier in many ways. Okay. So observations can be continuous, discrete, symbolic, uh, multi-dimensional, one-dimensional, whatever. Okay. Observations. And of course, it, this notion of measurability, I mean, the fact that I can measure it, is deep in the sense that okay, I have to define measurement, I have to really define what I mean by that measuring and observation. It goes beyond the scope of this course, but those of you who learned some physics, any, any natural science know that this is actually not, it's a tricky, tricky thing. So we, we assume that there is some, some, some sort of an observable or something, some operator that we can measure its expectation or something like this in general. Okay, so that's observation. The other component was uh, action. Actions, again, something tricky. At this point, our actions were, was the value of the decision. But usually, and I'm going to separate it uh, very soon into an action about my observation and an action about something which is really acting in the world. At this point, this is a set, another finite set of objects. So, I mean, if here I denote them by, by W or by omega, uh, so indistinguishable almost, uh, but they're different things. <laughs> and uh, here I denote these observations by lowercase x or whatever, as I said. So this here we denote it either by actions A or by alpha, depending, actually I prefer to keep alpha for other things, so usually I write A, actions. And then there was something else, what was it? Yeah. So, okay, so we have this very elementary thing, I mean, I'm really thinking about the essence of the decision making what are really the basic ingredients I can't do anything without. So there are many other things, but one of them, in order to actually generate some sort of a theory of decision making, I need this concept of cost, which we usually denote by lambda for some strange reason. But so this is a function which depends on what? So it depends on my action and the state of the world. So usually the assumption is that there is some cost involved with my action. It can be, and it doesn't depend on what I observe, it depends on what I do or what I decide. And of course the state of the world. I mean, if I take an umbrella and, and there's rain, there's a cost for that, and there's no rain, there's no cost for that. So it's a function from my world space times action, or Actually, I prefer the other way around, action times word space, into the real values. And so it's, it's a function of the action given the state of the world. Usually that's the way I want to think about it. If this is the action and this was the state of the world, this is the cost or the, the value. And, and in, interchangeably, you're going to talk about something you want to minimize, like cost, or, or, or price, or risk. Yeah, so this, is, this has many different names, risk, cost, and so on. These are all things that you really want to loss, whatever, you want to minimize. And if you're more optimistic about things, you know, sometimes you, you give it a positive value, something like reward, or value. Essentially for us now, this is the same, other than the sun. Okay? So we're going to talk about more complicated decision-making processes, for example, about maximizing expected reward, it's just like minimizing expected risk and so on. Okay? Uh, and, okay, so this was a already a complicated thing, but this, so if these are the elementary things, I mean, the, the world, the actions and the observations, this is already a function of these things. 
which is, which is more or less arbitrary. I mean, I assign some numbers to the actions, which may depend on your subjective value, on your uh, whatever, many, many things that really quantify this one. We'll try, this is one of the themes of this course, is really to, to try to get to some sort of an objective value, objective cost, which is, uh, I'm going to give you I mean, a spoiler, I mean, it's going to be related to the notion of information, but uh, we're going to build it up. Okay. And then, then there was something else, okay, so these are the, these four elementary things, more or less elementary, I mean, this, these are more elementary than this. But then there was something completely abstract, in some sense, which we call the probabilistic model. Didn't forget anything, no. So this is something, uh, sometimes we denote it by some curly P. So this is an abstraction. This is essentially an entity, a couple of entities, which are our invention. I mean, they don't, they don't exist in the world. This, this is, these are the way we actually describe the rules of nature in some sense. Or what, or what we call the constant, or the, the things that are really like more or less stable in the world. Which are, which, so this is the notion of stability, or the notion of, these are things that I can trust, it's really very fundamental to this concept. This is what we, what we call the statistical model. This is really a fundamental quantity. And in this case, we actually thought about it as two different things. One of them was a prior distribution, sometimes we denote it with P0, but I usually ignore this, a prior distribution over the state of the world. And uh, the other one was a conditional distribution of the observations given the world. So this is a choice. I mean, and I really want to, to make it uh, clear. I mean, this, is, this has an entirely different status in this particular object than the rest of the things. <laughs> it's not, not, no longer an elementary thing. This is something which, which is our conceptualization of the thing that we can trust in the world. So essentially, these things should be some sort of laws of nature. Or if not directly, in the sense that physics usually means <laughs> they should be related. So, for example, the fact that there are clouds, if there's clouds, there's higher probability of rain, and this is a very fundamental and property of the world. I mean, it's property of nature. It eventually depends on what we understand about rain and how it is formed and so on. So it summarizes some truth. <laughs> and that's why we can count on it. I mean, you can actually put it in these in this model, which is some sort of what, we, what I would like to call the stable part of the, the slow variable. This is slowly variable. This is stable in some sense that I'll have to define, or slowly variable. Slow variable. So, of course, it can be that in some other planet, on some other times, clouds and rains are not so easily associated. But uh, these, are, these are things that usually count. So, in some sense, in this statistical model, we are going to est estimate it based on history, based on experience, based on the things that we can trust and really believe are going to stay there. Okay, but that's an abstraction. Well, that's something we invent. And of course, let's say clouds and rain, or clouds and rain are related, but they're not uh, deterministically related. Okay, I can have clouds and no rain. Usually I cannot have rain without clouds, but uh, maybe, who knows? <laughs> so in some sense, uh, I express in this probability distribution some uncertainty of what I know, but this knowledge may not be perfect, may be only statistical. As, as some of you know, I mean, the fundamental laws of physics are, in some very deep sense, statistical by nature. I mean, even, even the very elementary things that we know about them. Yes? Shouldn't PW given X be more important than PX given Well, it's, it's equivalent. I mean, uh, this is the way we usually write it because these are the measurable things. I mean, in some sense, what you do in order to estimate or to, to learn these things is you, you collect, you look at all the rainy days, and then you look, okay, how, what fraction of them there was rain? Okay. And cloudy days, I'm sorry. You know, the, what, what fraction of them there were clouds? So usually these are more directly measurable. 
but, but, but you're right. I mean, there, there's no difference. Essentially, what I'm talking about is the joint distribution of W and X, which is just the product of this. And of course, the joint distribution can be factorized in many ways. Usually, this is the way we like to think about it. Okay, and then, the, so this is a very important concept. I mean, so this is summarizing our stable knowledge about the world, what we can infer from experience, from, from the history, from other things. Okay? Either given to us or not. Of course, at this point, we're assuming that they are given, but of course, the main part of the course is how do we infer them, how do we deduce them from observation, from data. And then there was another thing, which is our, actually our goal, which is uh, the decision function. Okay, so, so there was something I called delta, which is a function of my observation, which is essentially telling me, okay, so this is supposed to be a function, so delta is the decision function, decision function, it's a decision rule, which is essentially a function from the observation to the action. So this is the thing we really need to know. I mean, how do I decide? I mean, this is what we seek. How do I make a decision? What should I do when I see X? Okay? And uh, here we think about it as a deterministic function. And as I said, in general, uh, for the first part of the course, we, we will re usually assume, actually prove to you, and we're going to prove in the next exercise, I hope, that stochastic decisions in the simple, simplest Bayesian setting that we're talking about is not going to help you. It's only going to increase your expected risk, but, but later on we'll see that that's not always true. So we're also going to talk about policies. Policies is a stochastic function of the observation. So we may want to be not deterministic in our action. At this point, it's really not important. Okay. Okay. So once we have those ingredients, what? The, the goal is really to find what we call an optimal decision rule, essentially. So we need something which we call an optimality criterion. So this is important because this is again where arbitrary things can happen. So I'm, I'm defining something which I call optimality. Optimality criterion. And for some reasons which are not as arbitrary as it seems at this point, we really like, like to think about the expected risk. Okay, so I define something which I call the total or expected risk, which is a function of my, it's actually not a function, it's a functional of my, of my decision rule. Essentially, okay, if you give me your decision rule, I mean, you tell me how you want to make the decision, which means you give me a function from the observation to the action. I don't care how you do it. And then I want to evaluate it. I want to tell you how good it is. So the natural, natural in, in the statistical context, is, it's natural because expectations are very important things. <laughs> and, but I want to to make sure that you understand why they're important. So what's that? That's the assumption behind it. So essentially, what I'm telling you, okay, average with respect to the, all the stochastic things in, in, my, in my model, which are the states and the observations, average the cost. But the cost, when I make my decisions according to this particular rule. Okay, so that's what it means. Okay, so the cost was a function of the action and the state, but now I'm deciding what action to take according to the rule delta. By the way, if this was a stochastic rule, then I have to average also over the stochasticity of the rule. Okay, but otherwise it's exactly the same. Okay, and so what is this? This was simply the sum over the state of the world, the sum or integral, depending if it's continuous or, or discrete. At this point, you should worry about it. I mean, uh, if you actually do an integral over, over the density distributions or, or a sum over a probability, a discrete probability distribution, it's up to you. I mean, this is technical. But 
Okay, so it's the sum, just the definition of expectation of these two variables times this function. I, I write it like this just to make it to be more explicit what I mean by this. But then, of course, I can break it down in various ways. For example, I, I can first average over x and then average over the state. This is the same thing, right? I just break the condition, that's exactly what I mean. And then put this... Uh, What do you mean intersection? It's a condition. Okay, I first average over the x, and then given x, I average over the state conditional x. Okay, this is a very standard thing. We're going to do it many, many, many times. So, uh, again, the action here is selected according to my decision rule at the state omega. So, and of course, I can also break it in another way. I can break it... Uh, when I first sum over the states of the world and then average over x, it's exactly the same thing. Okay. So, uh, I'll shorten this notation in a second. Okay, so, so here comes something very simple. If I look at this, okay, this is given the observation, so usually the observation is given. This is at least the standard setting. I first observe and then make the decision. This thing here is what is essentially the risk, the average risk condition on the state. Okay, so on the observation. So this is what we call the conditional risk of A given X. So here I suppress the fact that A is actually chosen according to some policy. So for any action, this is the conditional risk. So this is what I call I think it's better to denote it by round brackets. So, so, uh, I actually try to be more or less consistent. <laughs> when I have square brackets, I usually mean what we call functional. So the function of a function. <laughs> this is a standard notation in most of mathematics. <laughs> and when I have round brackets, I usually mean function. So there are usually explicit values there. Okay? So this is the conditional risk or the observation condition risk. So this is the risk of doing A when I see X, when I see X. Okay, this is sometimes called the state condition risk. Okay. So just by writing it like this, you already see what we actually wrote as a theorem, it's actually a very funny theorem, that actually turned out to be important. So what's going to be the best, the optimal risk? So if optimal means minimizing the expected risk. So my optimality criterion is I want a decision rule which makes the expected risk minimal. Now let me just say a word about it. What does it mean? It means that actually I care about many repetitions of my decisions. And I want on average to be good. So sometimes I, I, I may make a wrong decision, but I want that on average I'm okay. So implicitly, when I say expected risk is my optimality criterion, I really mean, I mean really thinking about a world where things happen many, many times, and I repeat my experiments essentially such that the average really matters. Yes. What's your name, by the way? Daniel. Daniel, okay. No, delta not necessarily. I mean, delta, when I write delta, I mean deterministic. When I write pi, and I don't, I, I will do it later on, uh, we, we, we think about probability distribution of x. So stochastic rule means, okay, you come to a junction, you don't like to turn left or right, and you throw a coin or something. <laughs> or make a decision. Let's go 60% of the time here, 40% of the time here. It doesn't sound like a very, very smart thing to do in general. <laughs> But we'll see later on uh, that sometimes this is the best thing to do, actually. <laughs> but no, not in the current setting. The current setting is actually going to prove that if the model of the world is known, then the best thing is it's a ministry decision. Okay? So, uh, 
So if we want to minimize the expected risk, so we want to call the optimal, optimal function, oh, which is sometimes we call the base optimal, or delta B, same thing. The base optimal function is the, the function, the decision function, which is minimizing the expected risk. So I denote it by this uh, scary notation. The arg mean of all possible decision risks of R of delta. Okay, so this is my optimality criteria. Okay? Now, of course, as I said, I mean, you, you may want other optimality criteria. You may not want the expectation, you may want the, I don't know, the median, the maximum, the minimum, the, the worst case analysis. There are many, many ways to think about the decision rule, but at least we are simple, simple minded. We do expectations. Okay? So, if this is true, we have this funny theorem, which is essentially trivial, that the, the best optimal decision rule is what? It's the one which minimizes the condition of, uh, conditional risk. For theorem, delta B, so notice the difference. I mean, here it's a function, and here I'm evaluating the whole decision rule. For all possible axes, I have a value of action I want to, to make. And this is an explicit function of x. So this is telling me what to do when you see x. Okay? And the theorem is the base optimal is simply the one that's minimized over all possible action. And here's not delta, here's the action, the conditional risk. Ah, sorry, I'm not consistent. Conditional risk. You know, Mir's note is, is not too careful about these things, uh, about the brackets. <laughs> Sometimes I... Okay? And actually, I don't want to prove it. It's, it's trivial. But, the, it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful statement. It's telling me the best thing to do is to choose the conditional risk, uh, to minimize the conditional risk. So if you want an example, of course, the examples are the most important thing in any course, as you should know. <laughs> so, uh, so let's say that uh, X is... Uh, a real value variable. And in principle, if I have the models, I can calculate these things. I mean, I can calculate, if I have PW given X, and I have lambda, I can, uh, for every A, I can uh, calculate. So let's say that we're talking about A binary, which means A belongs to a set of A1 or A0 and A1. Okay, only two actions. Okay. And uh, so in this case, th there are going to be only two functions, two conditional risks, one for A equal one, and one for A equal two, or one for A equal A zero, and one for A one, and uh, they're both functions of X. So let's say this is one of them, and this is the other one. Okay? So in principle, these are functions you can calculate. I mean, this is going to be R, of A0 given X, and this is going to be R of A1 given X. Okay? So in principle, given those two functions, if you know the conditional distribution, as I said, I mean, to move from here to here, you need to use base rule in general, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if you know these two functions, you can calculate these two numbers, and this, so essentially, what, what the theorem is telling us, it's telling us that the, okay, so I'm not terribly careful here with my drawing, but sorry. So assume that the black is above the, the red from, from that point on. So essentially what it's giving us is a partition of X into regions. Into two regions. Okay, so for example, between here and here, which one is the minimum? The black one. So here delta should be, delta of X should be A0. And let's say that this goes uh, below this. So from here on, the red is minimal. Okay, so here delta of x is a1, and here again delta of x is a1, and so on. Okay, so whenever they switch, they switch across each other, I switch my decision. So essentially there are two regions here. So x is now, the space x is now divided into two regions. They're called D0 and D1. 
what, what exactly you decide on the intersection, it doesn't really matter. Make some decision. <laughs> so it's not going to change your optimality. So that points measure zero in this case, but it may not be measure zero, where the decision is ar arbitrary, choose one of them. Okay, it's not going to change, but... So essentially, this is a complete partitioning of space into two decision regions. One of them is where I decide zero, and the other one is where I decide one, and uh, I usually assume that they are disjoint. Okay, so that uh, uh, D1 and D0 are disjoint. But it doesn't really matter. But it matters, yeah, but it's, they may or may not be exhausted. Okay, so essentially, this is the answer. I mean, calculate the cognition of risk and minimize it. For, if you see X, look at what region it falls and make the decision. Okay? Okay, we'll see more, more explicit examples like this later on. Okay, so this is the theory. And so we first want to apply it to the simplest possible case. I'm sorry that I have to move there. So the simplest possible decisions, well, so I'm talking now about binary decisions. So you should have already saw this in the exercise. Binary case. Well, the binary case is essentially the assumption that omega is made out of two states only, and that the actions are also only two actions. Okay? So in this case, I don't care about x. Okay, x can be anything. In this case, uh, lambda, lambda a i omega j is a two by two matrix. Lambda one one, lambda one two, lambda oh, so, sorry, lambda one zero, lambda lambda zero zero, lambda zero one, lambda one zero, and lambda one one. Actually. Call it one and two, it doesn't matter. So it's a two by two matrix, okay? And uh, in this case, uh, the optimal decision is actually very simple. So the conditional risk in this case is what? So, okay, so this is a function, let's say A0 given X is what? So if you were, did you do it? Is it Nova? She, she gave us an exercise. Okay, so I'll just say it very quickly, because it's a bit tricky. So in this case, the condition risk is just uh, comparing, uh, comparing the two things. Uh, I don't want to take too much time on it. We have to do it anyway. So essentially, the condition of things here is, is, is the condition of risk is, is simply probability of zero times uh, the risk of making an action, I'm sorry, the, the probability of zero given x times the risk of making an action a zero at uh, v zero plus the other one, the probability of, of, of omega one given x times the probability of making an action zero at omega, and that the cost of, of making an action zero at omega one. This is exactly where, if you do it on the boat slowly, it's going to be uh, risky. So essentially, uh, what you get here is, is a very, very simple rule, uh, which is essentially the rule, the optimal rule, and, and, and you're going to see it yourself, is look at the likelihood ratio. Okay, I'll say exactly what I mean by this. Look at the ratio of these two probabilities. And this is something you should see. Exercise. Okay? Compare and compare it to what? Okay, I want to taking this minimum risk, minimum conditional risk, essentially comparison. In this case I have two functions to compare. So I have to compare it to, so I write it like this, and some sort of comparison to a function which depends on the priors times something which depends only on the costs. It's, uh, 
Um, and in this it doesn't really matter, but uh, something like one zero minus uh, one one like zero one minus zero zero. Something like this. Okay, so these are three numbers. This is going to be the, the, the decision. What I mean by this? You look at the ratio of the ob likelihood, as you call it, of the observation in one state of the world to the likelihood of the observation in the other state of the world, and you compare it to something which depends on the priors of the states, modified or multiplied by some function which depends on the, on the cost. Okay? So if I assume that this is a positive number, such that if I divide it, it doesn't change any quality, it's a technical thing, it doesn't really matter. Essentially what you have here is a very nice type of rule. This is a function of the observation only. So this is going to be essentially our decision rule. This is going to result in the decision what to do. And it's also called this particular ratio of probability, it's called probability ratio or sometimes uh, it calls likelihood ratio. Uh, okay, so this is an important function. We'll see it again and again. Likelihood ratio or probability ratio. And this is some sort of a number which doesn't depend on x. It depends only on our prior beliefs on the state of the world and the cost. Okay, so this is some sort of a threshold. independent of x. Okay? So, uh, this is nice. Essentially, it tells us the optimal decision. This is the base optimal decision. The optimal decision is depending only on the likelihood ratio of observation and some threshold which, in principle, we don't really know. I mean, we may know the priors, but the costs are more or less arbitrary. So. I mean, okay, so it depends some, but essentially it, it tells us something very, very important. We're going to see it again and again. The optimal decision is made by comparing the likelihood of the two, the likelihood ratio of the two observations to a, a threshold, a number, so I may later denote by theta here, as Amir does. And this is a threshold which is going to select for us essentially the probability of error, the expectation, not probability error, the conditional risk in this case. Okay, so this is something I, I want you to see. And you will. Very simple. These are the kind of things that you don't want to do on the board. But I, I do want to take a very special and very important case where the lambdas, the, the costs, are the simplest possible. Okay, so, so let's take one very special case. How much time do I have before the break? Two minutes. Carmel is not here. I'm so. here. Ah, you're here. Sorry. I'm used to see him there. <laughs> I have a very photographic memory, so I usually remember place people exactly where they were in the last time. <laughs> That's all right. So, uh, some, somebody should remind me. <laughs> but, uh, so in principle, uh, we take a very special cost, binary cost, which we called, it's going to be zero. So in, in this case, there's some sort of uh, duality or a very simple connection between the state of the world and the action. So it's, it's very much like the umbrella rain case. You want to take an umbrella if there is rain, if the world is rain, and you don't want to take an umbrella if the world is not rain. Essentially, the decision here is essentially a decision about the state of the world. Not necessarily the case. You may want to do something which may be taking a, ra a raincoat, for example, may have value even if there's no rain. Okay, so on. So, uh, so uh, decisions can not, not, are not necessarily identical, but in this particular case, they are essentially identical to deciding on the state of the world. So in this case, that we actually want to make the same about the state of the world, we actually like the, this particular decision a cost uh, matrix, which is zero if I equals j and is one if I is not j. You know, okay, if I made the right choice about the state of the world, I, I paid zero, which means I took an umbrella and there was rain. And if I didn't make the right choice, I pay one. 
This is uh, in mathematics, this is exactly what we call 1 minus delta ij, where delta ij is the chronicle delta, those of you, or the identity matrix. <laughs> okay? So, uh, in this particular choice of the decision, what you're going to have is again something you should see in the exercise. So, these are going to be essentially just one. Just one. Just one number. And the uh, and the risk, and the conditional risk in this case, are x given uh, the state of the, the world, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, r of action given x, is going to be, in this case, let's say I decide a0, is going to be the probability of 0 and Let's, get in, let's even write it like this, R of AI, I mean, this can be more than one dimensional, more than two, in general, this can be N on N, okay. I said two on two, but let's say that there are N decisions and N actions, so just to make it more general. So this is going to be essentially the sum of, over all J not equal I of the probability that I actually made the J's decision at the I state. Okay, so what is this? Since I essentially summing of this is it's very simple exercise, just average over this one minus delta, and you see that you really sum of all the probabilities of decision except the one which for which this is going to be zero, which is I equals J. Or oh, this is essentially nothing but one minus the probability of A j at wj. So what is this? This has a very simple interpretation. This is the probability that I made the wrong decision. Okay? It's the probability that I decided I and the world was not in the I state. Okay? So in this case, where the decision is essentially about the state of the world, choosing the wrong state of the world is an error. So this has a very simple interpretation. This is the probability of error, of wrong decision, or probability of error, probability of error. So actually, that, there are two types of errors, as you know. In this case, in the, in the binary case, there are two types of errors. I can make an error in two ways, okay? You all know that. What are those two types of errors? Yeah, so, so essentially, it's actually important. I mean, we, so one of them is what we call false positive or type 1 error. And the other one is what we call false negative or type 2 error. So this is important because it's seen everywhere in all science and you really need to know that. So false positive is the probability that we decide positively on what we test. And actually, this actually goes through hypothesis testing. I'll say something about it right after the break. And the other one, so it's, it's deciding omega zero when you're not in omega zero. And false negative, it's just, it's just names, yeah. <laughs> confusing names actually. False negative is that you reject omega zero incorrectly. Okay? Both of them are here. So it, in I, J, J only go from one to two. There are two types of, two terms here. One of them is the probability that I decide omega zero, but decide A zero, but actually was in omega one. And the other one is a probability that I decide omega 1 and actually was in, in a, a, a 1, but actually was in omega 0. So I'll go back to this in a second right after the break. And this is actually important. So this but, but in this particular case where this is the cost function, the risk turns out to be the probability of error. It's the sum of two types of errors in the, in the binary case. In the, in the multi Multi-dimensional case where the, where, where the number of states is more than one, more than two, then it's much more complicated because there are many types of errors. I mean, I can confuse one with three and one with four and two with five and whatever. So this is a, a much complicated structure of errors, and that's why we usually don't want to talk about it. So we really want to discuss simple decisions. Simple decisions are the cases where we have a binary choice and we have to make a, a binary decision. Okay. Any questions? No, it's, I'm sorry, I here. My mistake. 
I was here, and you're not summing. Here you summed over J here, but I was fixed. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, that's a good comment. Any more questions before I take a break? All right, so, so what I want to do next is essentially extend this binary case a little further and tell you something about what statisticians call hypothesis testing, simple hypothesis testing, which is essentially binary decision. But because they have other ways of saying things, <laughs> they call it, you know, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, and they have, and they call the first type of error they call significance, and the second part of error, second type error they call the one minus the power of the test. <laughs> and we're going to say a few things about it just to make sure that you understand it, but it's actually a very simple thing. And then we're going to prove a theorem, which actually turns out to be important. It's something about, uh, okay, so we know already about what is the optimal binary decision. The optimal binary decision is the one that minimizes the condition risk. In this case, it's simply minimizing the error. Okay, that's not a big deal. Not very surprising. But uh, we're going to extend it to something called the name of Pearson lemma. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this distinction between Bayesian and not Bayesian again. But uh, uh, actually, this turned out to be very important. Simple again, simple to prove, but very important result. One of the fundamental results in statistics. So this is right after the break. Then we extend it further to multiple decisions, multiple states, and so on, and multiple observations. No, no, the name of the is what I'm I 
that I'm still uh, very slow compared to what I need uh, prefer to do. So, so there is a, in this case, in the binary case, where, where i and j are just uh, 0, 1, two cases, uh, we, as, uh, as somebody said, I mean, that, so the matrix, of course, In this case, uh, lambda 1, 1 and lambda 0, 0 are, are 0, because the diagonal is 0, and uh, this is simply 1. But uh, of course, you may, you see that lambda 1, 0 and lambda 0, 1 are actually related to, to two types, the two types of error. One of them is deciding 0 when you're actually in the first state, in one state, sorry, and, and, and the other one is deciding 1 when you're in the 0 state. So these are the cost of the two types of errors. And uh, of course, in, in many cases, these two types of errors are not uh, equally costly. Uh, this is just a simplifying assumption. And if they are not equally costly, you see, for example, 1, 0 may be much more, cost, much more important to you than 0, 1, like false negative or false positive. I mean, if you're deciding on a medical treatment, for example, something like this, sometimes. Uh, making the wrong decision can be very, very different in one direction and the other, very non-symmetric. So in this case, the, the cost ratio is going to just act against the priors, in some sense. So if the costs are equal, it's the prior ratio which is going to determine your threshold. So simply, x is going to tell you something beyond the prior, only if, of course, x is informative, and I'll say something about this. If x is not informative, which means x actually don't tell you anything, then uh, this likelihood ratio is going to be what? Let's say that x doesn't tell you anything about the world. It's you decided to measure the phase of the moon, or oh, actually the phase of the moon may actually tell you something, but. Uh, about, I don't know, the elections, but uh, or something completely irrelevant, and you're trying to make a decision based on this observation. So in this case, if, so what we call an informative observation, this is just a note, so if Px over, if this is not informative, if x is not informative, what is this going to be? So if x is independent of omega, x is independent of omega, this is going to be what? This is, of course, the same as p of omega given x over p of omega. So this may be more directly clear. I mean, so this is actually telling you how much did the probability of omega change when you see x, you see x, compared to what you know if you don't see x. Okay, so if this ratio, which is the same as this one, this base rule, if this ratio is 1, then essentially we don't learn anything. X is not an informative observation. And in this case, uh, 
this ratio is going to be just the, just the, 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 the prior ratio, and the, and the whole thing is going to be determined only by the costs. Okay. Nothing, no information. Okay, remember this, we actually want to relate it to, to the notion of information, so we already see intuitively that my intuition about X being informative about the world is related to how much this ratio changed from 1. Okay, this is one thing. But now, so in the Bayesian case, the probability of error is made out of actually the risk of the Bayesian decision. So, so this, everything I said here, of course, was for the base optimum. This uh, probability of error is, is based on the assumption that I compared the likelihood ratio to threshold. I just changed the threshold to be simple, just one. So, uh, actually, in many cases, we don't really want to, we don't really know the risk. We want to minimize the probability of error, and we want to play with these two types of error. So, what is the optimal Bayesian risk in this case? This is simply the probability of state one times uh, the probability of error, which means I actually made the decision A1 at the state omega zero, plus the probability that the state was actually one, and of course I average, average over, so, sorry, I average over all the actions in this case. So uh, this is the conditional risk that I'm, that I'm averaging it. So the probability, it's the probability of state zero times something which I call the probability of error uh, of, of, uh, of delta, delta V plus probability of P1 times the other probability of error of delta V. And alpha and beta in this case, so alpha is what we call the type 1 error, which is essentially the probability of false positive in a positive testing. I actually need to say something about why we call it false positive. And the type 1 error, which is the probability of what? That x belongs to the decision 1 when I was actually, sorry, x belong to the not, doesn't belong to the decision one when I was actually in the state omega one, and uh, the probability beta. I'm sorry, this is beta. This is so confusing. The probability that x belongs to d uh, one. I decided one when I was actually at omega zero. And type beta, or type 2 error, I know that some of you don't really see what I write here, but uh, it's the, the false reject, false negative. This is the probability that x belongs to d, not, doesn't belong to d1 when I was actually at omega 1. Okay, so, so let me say it more, more formally, just to... So hypothesis testing is a name given in statistics to simple binary decisions when we actually divide the state of the world into two, two partitions, and omega zero is usually called the null hypothesis, For reasons which I never understood, the null hypothesis and uh, and the omega one is called, or sometimes we call it H zero. We usually call it H zero, the null hypothesis, and omega one is called the alternative. So this is actually based on the assumption that usually we want to reject an hypothesis or. Uh, uh, or, or accept an hypothesis, and there's one is really very important, the alternative is not so bad. So the alternative hypothesis, omega zero or H1. And uh, again, the, the Bayesian optimal decision is essentially telling us 
decide if, if, if I actually look at uh, this particular cost matrix, then uh, my um, accept omega zero versus reject omega zero is simply looking at the rate likelihood ratio. And again, I, I want to emphasize what I mean by this and compare it to the prior ratio. And the, the lambda is zero. So this is the base optimal decision. But in statistics, we usually want, don't want to be Bayesian. In some sense, we don't want to assume anything about priors. For all sorts of reasons. I mean, uh, you may have heard a little bit about it already from other people, but uh, mainly because we don't really know how to assign priors. They're not, they're not always explicitly measurable. It is some sort of a subjective assumption. So uh, statisticians, especially those that are non-Bayesians, uh, try to formulate everything important, and I thought this testing is certainly something important in statistics, uh, in, in a way which is independent of uh, any assumption about prior. So usually they... Uh, yeah, so... so um, what we know about the Bayesian risk is something which I'm going to use, but I, I would like to give you the alternative formulation, which is really the non-Bayesian formulation, which is usually called, uh, which is related to this thing which we call the optimal hypothesis testing or the name of Pearson lemma, and that's what I'm about to get now. So essentially, if we are Bayesian, we have an answer. We know already that the best possible decision is the one which minimizes so this is something I want you to verify. I wrote it very quickly. It's very, very simple. So essentially, in, in the, the Bayesian risk is the weighted error average. So it's the probability that I am at actually at zero at, at the first state, and I made a mistaken decision, which I mean I rejected omega zero by mistake. This is alpha. And uh, plus the probability is actually at, at zero at the state one, and I rejected omega one by mistake, which I called beta. Now, in hypothesis testing, they usually call alpha, alpha is called the significance level. Significance level, this is the, and this is usually the important number I want to minimize. I want to guarantee that it's small. So when you write a, a paper in an experimental science, and I mean, let's say in psychology, and you say that the results are significantly, the significance of 5%, usually what they mean, or always what they mean, is that this number, the probability that my hypothesis is wrong, is less than 5%. Okay, that's considered to be very, very important. Okay. If your results are not significant, I don't know if significant, it means it has a high probability that you're actually saying something wrong. So I want this to be small. Is 5% good or not, depending on many, many other things. It's really not good enough if you have a... It means one out of 20, you are wrong. And if your sample was... Uh, of, course, of course, there are all sorts of tricks of how to cheat in uh, statistics, and one of them is really uh, taking a, very a big sample, select those that that have a high significance and then ignore the others or, or many, many other things. So there, there are all sorts of uh, cheating and tricking uh, the reviewers with cheating with the significance level. But of course, you always have to look at, at, at the other error because what is really important to me at least, if the two types of, error, uh, of errors have the same cost, and this is the assumption here, if they don't have the same cost, then I have to weigh them by the, the, the proper cost because each one of them is, so each one of those will be multiplied by lambda 1, 0, and 1 lambda 0, 1 accordingly. But if these two lambdas are the same, this is precisely there on both ones. So what, what do we mean? What, what did we prove our optimal Bayesian decisions? We proved that among all possible decision rules, the sum, the weighted sums of the error is minimal. Okay? For the Bayesian decision. Okay, so now we want the other thing, beta, uh, is actually uh, so the probability of Second type, two types, type two error. Uh, 
And this is usually not the way we think about it. You actually think about something else, which we call y minus beta, which is essentially the probability of what? It's usually called the power of the test. Or be it outsma, than overcoot. Significant than overcoot. Power is outsma. So, um, usually what we want is to guarantee the significance. Because this is considered more important. And then we would like to have a test which has more, okay, let's say a fixed alpha. I think up at 5% or 20% or whatever you want. And what, what would be the optimal, optimal uh, test in this case, or the optimal decision? So I thought this testing is, is a decision. I have to decide if, my, if I'm in a, the first case, the hypothesis one, in the null hypothesis, or not in the null hypothesis, or reject the null hypothesis. So it's a decision about, about something. Which can be, as I said, in medicine, for example, it's just a decision about whether the diagnostic has, it's telling you that it's sick or not, or so on. And uh, so it can be important. So what we really want, would like to do is to, to have to fix the significance level and to maximize the power. So in statistics, they don't care about priors. They really care about probabilities of error. That's really important. They don't want to assume anything about priors. And uh, usually, so you're asking, uh, okay, the, what is what is the, the most powerful test? Powerful test, which is uh, maximum maximize one minus beta, given alpha. Given alpha. This is what I want in statistics. This is what I want in non-Bayesian statistics. Okay? Yeah. So it depends what you call the null hypothesis. <laughs> I mean, what is, which one is important to you? If the null hypothesis is, let's say, talking about a medical diagnosis, okay, and you want to reject the fact that I'm sick, okay, based on some test, and then uh, I want the probability that I'm wrong to be small. I don't care about anything else. But out of all, so I want the probability that I'm telling you that you are not sick and you're actually sick to be less than something which depends on my insurance eventually, but on how much I'm going to pay if I'm wrong. But, uh, uh, but uh, out of all the possible tests that I want, I want the one that minimizes the second type of error. Minimizes the second type of error is maximizing the power. Okay, so this is usually the way statisticians think about it. It's of course, as, you, as most of you I think see, this is a very a special case of what we said with the Bayesian rule, except that I don't want to assume anything about priors. Okay, so here comes a, a, a very, by the way, usually what we plot when we think about different tests or different learning rules, we actually like to plot a significance level versus the power. And, and the, so this is the power of the test and this is the error. And, and this is going to be a curve which is what? How does it going to look? So usually, the higher the significant level, I mean, the higher the error, I can get probably higher power, so it's going to be a monotonically increasing function. And it's usually going to look like this. This is sometimes called the ROC curve. You're going to see this, uh, not exactly defined that way, but that's good enough. So, uh, and of course, if I have an optimal test, going to give me zero significance level with one with zero beta. <laughs> okay, so it's going to jump immediately to the to one. So this is one here and one here, so the square. So essentially the ratio of the area under the curve as we call it to one is going to tell me how good is my test in some sense. So if I have a better test this is going to climb higher. If I have an optimal test with zero, <laughs> with zero error, with zero significance, I, I, I mean zero significance error, I, I, will, 
and we'll have a cap capture everything, no rejection of the other side. So generally, if I just want to minimize alpha, it's very easy, just reject everyone. Or don't reject anybody. Don't reject anybody, I'm surely going to, anybody who's coming to me is going to tell me he's sick, I'm surely not going to miss the sick people. But that's a very, not a very clever decision. <laughs> so usually you really want this trade-off, and this is a very fundamental trade-off. I mean, how do I find the most powerful test at a given alpha? So I'm giving alpha, and I want to maximize one minus beta. Okay, so the theorem, which is really a triviality, uh, it's not really triviality, but it's very simple if we allow what we to, to use what we already learned about, about uh, Bayesian decisions, I'm keeping it here, so it's called the uh, lemma, whatever lemma, it's called the Neyman Pearson lemma, Neyman Pearson, two very important statisticians that will see these names again and again when we start to talk about, the, uh, about, the, uh, about estimation and other things. This is 1993, very early in the days of statistics, um, of mathematical statistics. And so what they, what they essentially argue is, again, to us now is going to look almost trivial. just want to formulate it correctly. The most powerful test Powerful test, um, given uh, which means which means maximize uh, one minus beta, given uh, significant level significant alpha um, level alpha is given by what do you think? Compare the likelihood ratio Compare it to a threshold Okay, so this looks very, like a very simple case of what I said before The only thing, so the threshold of course theta Is going to depend on the significance level That you choose Okay, so, and, uh, but, but this is the best you can do. So actually I'm going to give you a very simple argument why this is obvious, using the Bayesian idea. We already proved that for the optimal base, the combined error, the weighted average of the errors is minimal. Okay, because this is the condition, this is the total risk of the Bayesian in this particular case with this particular cost, okay? So all I need to do is to invent the prior. So I know that. Okay, so so here's a proof which is based on uh, based on uh, on uh, on what we know already on the base optimal. And actually, I'm going to give you an exercise. Oh, nobody's going to give you an exercise to prove it without any assumptions about prior. So actually, it's a good exercise, but it's very simple, but you learn something from it. So essentially what I do, okay, I know this. So all I need to do, I know that the base optimal is exactly the same thing but I have to compare it to the prior ratio. Um, yeah. So let's call this theta. This is my choice of theta. Or in some sense, let's choose, invent the prior. I know the Bayesians, the non Bayesians don't like prior, so I'm call it, this is my invented prior. So just call the, this ratio, so p omega zero over p omega one is simply p omega zero over one minus p omega zero. And I call this theta which means that p omega zero is going to be uh, theta over one plus theta and p omega one is going to be one over one plus theta. Okay. So I simply change the threshold to a prior ratio 
And then I said, okay, uh, given this, I know that uh, the base optimal error is the, mi is the minimal, which means I know that R delta base, in this case, is simply uh, uh, theta over 1 plus theta alpha of delta B, or delta optimal, plus uh, 1 over 1 plus theta beta. This is, by the way, the reason alpha and beta appear here is why I moved to the actions to A, because I want to confuse you. But this is, of course, this is what we already proved. This is smaller or equal than the, base, the, the total risk of any other decision rule. Any other decision rule, this is the minimum. This is what, with this particular prior, this is the minimum. Okay? Which is uh, the same, yeah, in this case. Uh, it's theta over one, minus one plus theta alpha of delta plus one over one plus theta beta of delta. Okay. So, uh, so from this it follows, okay, let's just call this uh, P0, P omega 0, and this P omega 1, just to make sure that uh, it's, in, in this case, this is just a notation. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, I, I, I cooked the prior from the threshold. So given the threshold, this is what it means. P omega 0, P omega 1. And what we get from that is the following uh, very simple statement, actually written here already. Let me write it here. Now that this part of the board is really uh, not visible to all, so I'm trying not to use it. Uh, so essentially what we get from here is, is a very simple statement. P omega, so this, just changing the, some algebra, P omega zero, if you want theta over one minus theta, of alpha, so this is actually calling it delta B is a bit confusing, this is delta theta. This is the, the one I do, I, I, the, this is the, optimal base when I cooked it from the particular theta I used. Okay, so, the, if the, if, so it's alpha of delta theta minus alpha of any other delta uh, should be less or equal or less I should compare to the, the, the test is, is this omega 1 times well, it's actually less than this. If I decide this, it's beta of delta minus beta of delta and theta. So I know it's a bit confusing what I did here. I mean, just delta and theta and delta base is the same thing. I just, this is what I mean. I, I, I choose a, a prior such that this particular delta theta is a base optimal decision. Okay, but since we assume that these two numbers are positive, what it means that if, if this is negative, let's say beta delta is actually smaller than beta delta theta, which means that the right hand side is going to be negative, this inequality tells us that what? That this also has to be negative. And since P omega is positive, uh, it means that delta, that alpha of delta is larger than alpha of theta. So if, so this immediately implies that if I have a, a, a better beta, which means that if a beta of delta is smaller than my claimed optimal, then alpha of delta is larger than alpha of delta. Okay? And this is essentially the proof of the theorem. Yeah? Is this why you're calling this delta theta? Yeah, okay. I, I, I was. Uh, I said, okay, I, the claim of uh, Neymar and Pearson is that 
if I compare the likelihood ratio to the threshold theta, then I'm the best possible given some alpha. Okay? I have the best beta given some alpha. So now, oh, and of course, I, I just looked at this particular equation and said, okay, this is exactly what we said about the Bayesian case. If I only replace theta by a ratio of two primes. So I call this particular choice, this particular choice, the name of this choice, I call it delta theta. This is the choice made with theta. But then I turn it into a Bayesian, a Bayesian decision by assigning priors depending on theta. Okay, so this, this, calling this P0 is the Bayesian world, calling it theta over one on plus theta is the, the name of Pearson, not the, the frequency world. So essentially by, I, I switch this into Bayesian, essentially this is the optimal base, but I, for this particular theta, I cooked up these two priors, and for this particular prior, this is, a, this is an optimal decision, optimal base. So now I, I simply wrote it down. This optimal base told me that, I have to, that this is smaller than this in general, because this is what I just wrote, the fact that this is the optimal. The weighted error is minimal for the base optimal. And from this, I get this very simple uh, rule. I mean, so if this is negative, this must be negative also, which means that I will not get a better beta without hurting alpha. Okay? And that's essentially what Naomi is saying. Of course, the opposite is also true. But they have to be... Okay, so I suppose I can play the same game in the other way, but this is what they wanted. They wanted, give me alpha, and show that you get the best beta. I assume by now, if you want to, in contradiction, here is something which should, if this actually gives me something better, then I have my alpha. Okay, so this is QED. I know it's a bit tricky. I mean, it looks like it's somewhat formal argument, but very simple. Okay, so now I want to do something really in the rest of five, ten minutes. So this is called the nlp lemma. I want to extend the whole decision model. By, by the way, I'm going to give you an exercise to prove it directly. In a sense, prove the nlp lemma as it is proved in most textbooks in statistics without assuming any prior. You don't know what prior is, don't want to think about prior. And of course, it's as simple, but you can do it directly, and that is a good exercise. Okay. Now, now, now I'm going to really change, uh, extend the whole story. So I want to... I want to somehow take these very simple decisions, binary decisions that we made, and expand them in three different directions. The first one is many observations, what we call multiple observations. This is actually extremely important practically. So let's say that I don't have one x that I measure, I have a sequence of many x's. And I'm going to assume that those x's are as much as possible independent. Okay, which means x is now going to be a vector, x1, x2, and so on, xn. And I want to understand how, and they're going to be iid. So what do I mean by this? What is iid? Okay, the, anybody never heard it before? So iid is uh, something, one of those uh, acronyms that we use all the time. Essentially, assuming that those, each of those observations is taken independently of the others. Sometimes it's not that easy to do, as we're going to see later. So essentially, what we assume here is that xi is distributed, and this is a notation that we're going to use all the time for distributed according to the distribution. Some px given omega for all omega, independently. Which means I, I'm going to take care in my measurement that the result of one measurement is, got, is not going to affect the result of the other measurement. It's up to me to make them independent. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So far, I didn't say anything. I mean, I, x could be multidimensional before. But now I'm going to assume something much more, much more specific, that x are actually identical measurements of the same variables drawn independently. So it's, it's just like, you know, taking a, let's say I want to decide about the weather, the rain today, I look at the cloud, and then I open another window, I look at the cloud, and open another window, independent window, and look at the cloud. It's not so that easy, by the way. But let's say that I have enough windows that are completely independent from each other. So that I <laughs> and, and each one of them is going to be another measurement. Or let's say that I want to measure the temperature. I'm, ju I'm just making it a little funny, but it's, it's actually very serious. I mean, let's say that you measure temperature. Okay, so I measure independently the temperature in the same day, in many places, or in, in different conditions of water. Actually, give you, I'll give you an exercise which, where this is actually very, very going to, to impress you. So let's say that these are letters in a language. Actually, this is an exercise you're going to program uh, next week. So let's say that I'm giving you text, and I'm telling you this text is coming is either in English or in Spanish, or in Italian, I don't know, whatever. And I'm telling you, OK, the difference between English and Italian for, that, for the method that you care about is that the probability of letters is slightly different. Which means, OK, E is very common in English, and it's less common in Italian, and I is very common in Italian, or A is, and so on. So the ratio, the likelihood ratio of the letters are not identical. And now I'm telling, I'm telling you, OK, sample independently the text, which can draw letters at random from a text and decide if it's Italian or English. This is uh, something you're going to program. It's a very, very simple exercise. This is something I can actually do. And you're going to see how powerful these ideas are, because you can decide, in this case, with very high significance, probability of less than one uh, percent error, uh, weighted error, uh, uh, if uh, within something like 10 letters. That's it. Just based on the probability of single letters. Okay, so this is going to be an exercise, but, uh, but in this case, assume that I can actually sample already. So what does it mean? Okay, by the way, this is the first extension that I'm going to do, and I'm going to do two others, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today. The first one is called HMM, and second, the third one is called MDP. But I'm not, this is something we're going to discuss later. Okay, so in the case of independent, uh, independent uh, assumptions, so what do I know about the probability of, of x1 to x and given omega? If they are drawn independently, what does it mean? Yeah, OK. So I want all of you to see it. So what does it mean to independently draw this thing? What is the, prob the joint probability of the observation given omega? It's, it's simply the product. OK, that's actually extremely important to realize. So which means, OK, you said that our second axiom <laughs> In probability was that independent events, the probability is multiplied. It's probably the most important action. <laughs> so uh, this is going to be the probability of xi given on. This is this assumption, OK? That are independently drawn, which means the probability of seeing one instance of x is independent of the other one, and the probability of seeing all of them together is going to be a product, a long product. So these are products of many small numbers, so this is going to be very small, very big, <laughs> if you have long products. Okay, so we'll have to do something about it. But, uh, so now I just want to very quickly write down our decision rules in this case. We have no time, um, but, okay, this is something I wanted to do. So in this case, the likelihood ratio so again, the optimal base, the base optimal, which is also happen to coincide with the, likely, the name of Pearson lemma, is compare the likelihood ratio to the threshold. Okay, and the threshold may or may not depend on the prior. It's up to you how to think about it. So, uh, so I look at the ratio. Given omega zero divided by p x1, xn, given omega 1. And what is this? 
So first of all, it's the product. The product of uh, those ratios. Is this clear? I mean, I take two the product and made it into one product. <laughs> the ratio of the product and turn it into one product, okay? But this is something interesting. I mean, okay, and this, of course, what the uh, name and person and David Sotman told me, compare this to some threshold, okay? Which may, uh, you can write it any way you want. But now I'm, I want to look at the, how such products behave. So products, these are IID independently drawn random numbers. The fact, since X is a random number, the ratio of the proof is also a random number. It's a random variable. Now, products of random numbers don't behave very well. What does behave well? Sums. Actually, that way, that's the deepest statement I'm going to say today. So essentially, we know something very important. If I, if I have a random variable, let's say Z, drawn from some probability P of Z. What I know is that I have a long, many of them, if I take the empirical average of ZI, uh, what is this going to look like? So if I average numbers, this is called the, the weak law of large numbers, actually maybe the most important uh, law in, in elementary statistics. What is this going to look like when n is, is very large? Yeah, so this is going, so this is something I really want all of you to fully understand. It's very, very important. So this is going to be to, 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 to eventually approach the expectation of a, of a z of z, which is just the sum or the integral, depending if it's a continuous or discrete number, it doesn't matter. The sum of all possible z's of p of z times z, and we sometimes uh, write it like this, okay? It's good synthesis. <laughs> it's the same thing, okay? It's all the same. So this is called the, 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 the law of large numbers, or the weak law of large numbers. And this is really maybe the most important thing about statistics you have to remember at this point. So sums of random variables average. Not only average, it's going, in what sense it's going to approach this? To, can, for those of you who are a li little more careful about mathematics. So this is a random number, okay? It's a sum of random numbers. So it has a distribution, okay? But this distribution is going to get narrower and narrower and narrower around the expectation. So we say actually that this is a limit in probability. I'm not going to confuse all of you. <laughs> Essentially it means that the probability that this is not going to happen is zero. It's approaching zero where n is large. Actually there is a stronger law of large number, which all of you should have heard of, which is called the central limit theorem, which is essentially telling us that it's not only going to convert to the average, it has to, go to convert to a normal distribution around the average with the variance going like 1 over n. I'm going to come back to this. This is very, very important. So we know exactly how it's going to distribute eventually this sum. You know, under very, very general conditions, this sum is going to approach a Gaussian distribution. It's going to distribute it Gaussianly with a, a, a variance that goes like 1 over n, or, or standard deviation goes like what, know, square root of n. And, and this is essentially telling us the same thing. More precisely, it's going to converge in probability to the mean. Okay, remember this? Now, in order to actually apply this to this, what should I do? No. Take log. Okay. So, again, very, very important statement. I just take log of product. What is the log of product? The sum. Okay. So, I take the log likelihood ratio, not the likelihood ratio, the log likelihood ratio. All it allows me is to turn this long product into a sum of IID distributed numbers. Now, why the IID? Because each one of those ratio is independently, is a function of an independently drawn number. And as such, it's the same function. Log P of omega zero over P of omega one. Since it's the same function, these are again IID numbers. 
So I can apply the law of large numbers. We have to apply the law to the special law sum. Sorry? We have to apply the law to the special law sum, right? Sorry. The log of fraction. Of the, of the yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I have to log is a monotonically increasing function if you take it with base greater than 1. And I always assume that. <laughs> log can be either 2 or e or 10, depending on the context. In my case, it's mostly natural log, but it doesn't matter. It's just constant. So, uh, uh, so, okay, that's important. That's important in some sense because it's telling us that the log likelihood ratio over ID numbers is an important thing to understand. Now, I am out of time. So uh, this is where I'm going to start. To actually read it, this is going to converge in the limit if I take divided by n to something very to a constant. Actually, two types of constants, and these two constants are very very important. First of all, they're information theoretic in nature, in the sense which I'll explain it next time, and they are also uh, telling us something about how fast my errors are going to converge when I increase the number of observations. I'm going to show us essentially the errors decrease exponentially fast with an independent observation. So I can actually make alpha and beta exponentially small if I can really independently sample my world. And that's really important because I really want to make good decisions. So in order to make good decisions, you need to resample. Resample. Okay, so this is essentially the first interface between statistics and information theory, which I'm going to see. I wish I could have another hour this, this week, but I won't do it to Noga. By the way, on the 5th of December, I'm not going to be here. So on this week, I'm going to switch with Noga. Okay? The exercise is going to be on Wednesday. The lecture is going to be on Wednesday. All right, thank you.